Hello, and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you have sent me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com or have left for me in the comments section of my Q&A videos, and I will gather those up and put them into my queue as well. Hey, everybody, thanks for inviting me into your home again this week. Very much appreciate it. And I just want to remind everybody out there that this channel is 100% fan funded. And if you are enjoying this channel, getting something out of it, are being entertained, delighted, educated, or otherwise informed, then consider supporting this channel, uh, supporting me, supporting us, what we do here. All right. Uh, we have some really interesting questions. I also wanted to put a plug in for the podcast this week. Uh, posted yesterday is my second talk with The Insider, an anonymous source that I have within the Church of Scientology, who has been uh, dishing on life and uh, criminality and uh, how empty the place is these days and various things like that. So we had an interesting, another interesting chat, and that posted yesterday. So I hope you guys will check that out. That is the Sensibly Speaking podcast. And if you have not subscribed to that podcast, I will encourage you to do so, as well as checking out our live shows every Friday night where we call in. We have a call-in show here where you guys get to call in and talk to us, and I'm usually joined by my beautiful wife, Melissa, for those shows. So I hope you guys will get a chance to kind of join us to let our hair down and and just, just gab, just have a, you know, kind of unserious fun time every week. And we have a wonderful little community of people who come around every week and, and are, are part of that. And I hope you will be too. All right. So all that being said, let's get on with your questions. Wayne Cook. One thing that I've been thinking about recently is the possibility of implanted hypnotic messages installed during auditing. I was thinking back to when I was a Scientologist. A friend of mine was bragging about the fact he was in session for over two hours and didn't remember anything that went on. Has it ever worried you that a hypnotic command was implanted without your knowledge? What an interesting question, Wayne. And it's funny because you reminded me of a time where I also had um, not only noted myself as a Scientologist that there were whole sessions and sections of my auditing that I just couldn't remember at all. I just had no recall of what happened in those sessions. Um, but also, I remember one time a guy coming back from having done, I think, the L12 or something, some you know special confidential super, super super secret rundown out at Clearwater at Flag. And I was a staff member in Santa Barbara, and he was a public person. He paid a lot of money to go out and do this auditing. And he came back, and we were very, very interested in how did it go? Tell us everything you can. What was, what were the sessions like? And he said, you know, I can't even remember them. It was, it was like something so, he would say, he said, I can't even remember them. It was so simple. It was, so, it was like, what's that on your nose or something? I mean, it was, it was like that simple, he was saying. And, of course, to me, this sounded like like gobbledygook like what are you talking about it's like what's on your nose what, what, do, what do you mean that's that 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 can't be but it was odd to me that he so couldn't remember something that had just happened to him a few days prior uh when he was out in clearwater so i i so I've, this has been a this is noted wayne as a thing that people you know go into scientology or dynetics auditing sessions and they come out and they can't really remember a whole lot and it's like well what's up with that well, it has an awful lot to do, I believe, with the fact that you are inducing trance states in people who go into auditing. And you are putting them into these, you know, kind of catatonic kind of unconscious states from time to time, um, depending on the person, depending on the process, and depending on, you know, what you're doing with them. But the, re the repetition of the auditing commands or the procedure, the endless repetition of it, you have auditing commands that are, you have objective and subjective auditing. So you have this repetitious auditing that can occur where you are being made to touch things or look around at things or do motions over and over again, like sitting in front of somebody three feet apart from them and um, they're sitting right up on you. Your knees are touching pretty much and they're like, give me that hand. And you have to give them your hand, and then they put it back in your lap. Thank you. Give me your hand, right? Or give me that hand. Thank you. Give me that hand. Thank you. Give me that hand. Thank you. 
over and over and over and over again. This is called CCH1. And it's it's a little process that gets run. And you have to and you could end up sitting there giving some guy your hand or some woman your hand for three hours straight. You know, no breaks, just straight up. And if you think that's gonna not, you know, cause you to go to some weird places mentally, you know, you're not gonna just be sitting there in mindful in the moment for three straight hours doing this repetitious process, right? You're going to go off into other places. And those other places, that whole thing is called trance induction. You're going into some other trance state. You know, you're not really fully mindfully there. You're elsewhere. And um, and there's a lot that could be said and has been written about what these altered states of consciousness are. And, you know, and we can, we can uh, sort of dance around that the same way that people used to dance around the questions of how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, right? I mean, these are, you know, vitally important questions for some people. But for me, it's pretty much enough for to say, well, look, there's a, there's an altered state of consciousness there. There's a place where you go where you're not really aware of what's going on around you. You're kind of off in a dream state or something. And when that happens, words can have different levels of effect on you and can mean different things. And that's kind of interesting. And there's a whole, you know, thing to that. And some people are more affected by that than others. This isn't a universal thing. Everybody's not the same when it comes to this. What it takes to induce an altered state of consciousness, what happens to a person when they're there, how effective are words or phrases or suggestions to such a person in such a state, how often do you have to, you know, repeat commands at them, or how do the words get interpreted later in their memory from these trance states, very wildly variable stuff. Right. As you're, in other words, people are all over the place on this, but it's effective enough and it's a common enough phenomenon that we see people wrangled up into Scientology or similar cult situations because it's not only Scientology that uses repetition and mantras and chanting and ritual and things like that in order to induce these trance like conditions where people can become a bit more pliable or controllable, right, or coercive. Um, you know, they can be controlled more easily. So that's what this is kind of all about within the context of, of cults, which is what we're talking about. So with Scientology, you're, you're asking about, you know, post-hypnotic or implanted, rather, hypnotic suggestions, not necessarily just post, but implanted suggestions. And I will say that absolutely, that is that it absolutely happens in auditing sessions. Now, I looked up a little bit about hypnotic suggestions and, and this, this whole topic. And again, there's a lot. I could do whole podcasts on this, on this alone. But I wanted to go over a couple things. This is from a post uh, from a guy named John Mangiovi, who's a board-certified hypnotist. And this is a regulated activity. And there is something to know about this. And he, he wrote some things about suggestions that I thought I would share with you just to give you some you know, some other information about it. Um, increased suggestibility is a feature of hypnosis. The standard explanation to account for this increased suggestibility is that trance inhibits the activity of the conscious critical mind, thereby permitting hypnotic suggestions to influence the mind more easily. Um, so we have here direct uh, suggestions are straightforward statements that are usually obvious to the hypnotic subject. For example, you sleep easily or you do not smoke. Um, in contrast, methods of indirect suggestion, sometimes referred to as covert hypnosis, aim to influence the subject's unconscious without his knowing. Um, and this ha absolutely happens in a Scientology auditing session because you are being given or could be interpreting commands or statements the auditor is making to you or at you when you are in this sort of semi-conscious or hypnotic or, you know, altered state of consciousness where those words will have suggestive power over you. And there are auditing procedures. I, I earlier talked about objective, repetitious kind of auditing but there's also subjective repetitious auditing that will induce trance states where you're asked, for example, 
the same question over and over or the same set of questions over and over and over again. This is routine in Scientology auditing. There are thousands of Scientology processes and a great many of them are repetitious, okay? And they induce trance states. So when you're in a condition like that or put into a condition like that, other procedures that the auditors can engage in can definitely act as suggestions. There's um, a process that is a little complicated called listing and nulling. And any ex-Scientologists who are listening to this right now will know immediately what I'm talking about, where you are asked a question and you, are give, and you then give answers. Um, it's a multiple choice type of situation. You're asked, you know, what's your favorite candy bar, let's say. And that's a non-starter. That's not a question you would be asked in an auditing session. It's a, it's a silly example, but it's, it demonstrates the point. You might be asked this question, what's your favorite candy bar? Well, there is only one answer to that question. You only do have one favorite. But you might not necessarily, you might be waffling around a little bit on what that is. And so the e-meter could be utilized, and the auditor will ask you, and you go, oh, well, there's Mars bars, there's Almond Joys, there's... Kit Kats, you know, and the auditor will be watching the e-meter and then might call these answers back to you looking at the meter and looking for what response it makes. And based on its response, the auditor will indicate to you, well, your favorite candy bar is a Mars bar, right? And watches the needle and it should have this particular reaction and you're like, yeah, Mars bar, right? Mm -hmm. And that could very well act as a kind of suggestion to you. Maybe it's your favorite candy bar and maybe it's not. But when it comes to other kinds of more serious questions like what is, um, what is the biggest problem ailing you right now or what is your problem with your mother or something that actually has some emotional impact and importance to you, uh, something much more personal than what's your favorite candy bar, then um, suggestions are not necessarily what you need. And are not necessarily helpful to you uh, if you are being, uh, you know, given uh, hypnotic level suggestions. You could end up walking out of that session thinking that there's some really big problem with your mom, or some big problem at your job, or with your kids, or with some other interrelation, you know, personal relation or situation you've had in your past, where the auditor has now told you what your problem is, or told you what the what the issue is, and this is now acting with the power of suggestion over you. That's an, And that's just one kind of example. We could get into security checking and the kind of suggestions that might come from that, where you might be, you know, walking out of a, of a security check session, hmm, excuse me, thinking that you are the most immoral scumbag of the universe, right, because of various things the auditor might have said to you, um, during the processing, when you were in a relatively semi-conscious or trance state, not fully aware of what the auditor was saying or doing, and he's making suggestions to you that had actually have impact, you know, subliminally or subconsciously. So, um, so this could be a problem. This could also become a problem with commands because a post-hypnotic suggestion, going back to this, this write-up here, a post-hypnotic suggestion is a suggestion that's carried out after the hypnotic trance is terminated. For example, when you awaken each morning, you will feel refreshed and alert. Some people believe um, that a... Oh, we won't get into that right now. Um, it could be what it's basically it's summarizing. What it's basically going into is that a post-hypnotic suggestion could act in such a way that even after you're out of a trance state later on, if the circumstances come up that the, that the command or suggestion is, is uh, referring to, then you could re-enter a hypnotic trance state at that moment in order to enact out or carry out the command that you were given. It's a little, it's a little subjective. It's a little interesting, too. It's, it's just something people wonder about with this. But um, the post-hypnotic suggestion thing absolutely positively could be installed during auditing in order to get you to pay more money, be more compliant, uh, be more ethical, more in tune with what Scientology is demanding of you. And this will be not be couched in terms of a command like you're going to go out of this session and you're going to go pay the reg. 
They, they might not be that blunt, but, you know, after an auditing session, there's usually a little bit of chatter. And here you are in this sort of foggy, waking up, trance, semi-trance kind of state that, a, you know, a three-hour, four-hour auditing session might induce. And here's the auditor, even, even not maliciously talking to you about how now you're going to go see the reg and you're going to pay for your next service. And here he is giving you a post-hypnotic suggestion or command and is not even aware of the fact that that's what he's doing. But of course, that is what he's doing. So so it's not necessarily that this has to be done intentionally in order for it to, to happen or for it to be effective. And that is uh, that's the point I wanted to make with that. So could this happen? Does this happen with Scientology auditing? Uh, yes, absolutely, it does. And, um, you know, have I been worried about that? Well, not at this point. I'm no longer worried about it. But um, but I, this is a warning I try to give people when it comes to auditing and what it's doing to you. This is one of those levels that Scientology auditing is operating at that people don't even know about. They don't think about it. They're not educated in how this stuff works. And so they're completely unaware of the fact that Scientology auditing is actually hypnosis. And they will sit and defend it and fight for it and say it makes them feel good and their life is better as a result of it. So who are you to ask me or, or question what I'm doing? And I sit here and go, man, I don't know that you actually understand what's being done to you. And, you know, and this is like independent Scientologists as well as current Scientologists. And it's just, I go, man, you, you really, this is why you really got to educate yourself on what this stuff is all about and what it's actually doing to you, you know, because it's not in your best interest to improve your life through a bunch of, uh, you know, involuntary hypnotic suggestions. That's not, that's not how you uh, lead a bad or happier, one more wonderful life, you see. So, so it's only out of those, you know, concern for that kind of thing that I talk about this stuff. So anyway, there you go. Hope that answer helped clarify this. Nick C., you recently interviewed Catherine Olson, who left the Sea Org last year. In her interview, she mentioned getting assistance from an Aftermath Foundation volunteer. This got me curious. What's involved in becoming such a volunteer? The Aftermath Foundation's website, for obvious reasons, is very basic. Write to us and let us know what kind of help you're willing to provide. But there has to be more to it, right? Otherwise, there will be OSA plants in the system, if not right away, then eventually. Or am I being paranoid? All right, Nick, thanks for asking me about this. And I am not uh, affiliated with or connected to directly in, a, in sort of a, an operational capacity. I'm not connected with the Aftermath Foundation. I only support it, and I encourage you guys to do the same. I very much endorse what they are doing. But that being said that I'm not part of that organization or, or part of what they're doing, um, I, will, I can only speak from this, you know, from a limited knowledge set. But, um, but the, obviously, they have taken, you know, there are smart people who work there. This is Mike Rinder, Aaron, you know, Luis Garcia, the board there, the Headleys, there's various people there. And um, they're, they're well aware of, you know, what Scientology can get up to and the fact that OSA would want to tear apart the Aftermath Foundation uh, with malice and, uh, you know, an extreme prejudice. So, um, so they have to be careful. And I am not privy to all of the means and mechanisms they used in order to vet or check or, or otherwise make sure that their volunteers are on the up and up. But they definitely have procedures in place for that. I mean, there's just no question about it. Um, and I, I, you know, this is, already, this is I, I'm going to end up being a rather short answer because of that, right? Is um, also, of course, for security purposes, right? Anything I do know or that would be told to me about this would be information I can't really pass on, <laughs> right? Because they have to maintain a, a cloak, a veil, you know, of some degree of, of uh, confidentiality and secrecy in order to be able to operate at all. And this, by the way, is not just with the Aftermath Foundation either. This is one of the things that makes it so incredibly difficult to work in the ex-cult, cult exit 
sphere or space, right, is that you are actively being pursued and fought by every cult that exists out there. And there are thousands of them. You know, people ask me whether Scientology is fair game me or come after me. And sometimes I don't know if it was Scientology or if it was the Duggars group, right? The Gothard group, or if it was the Mormons or the JWs or countless other groups that I have criticized or talked about here on my channel as to who's coming after me, because they're all vindictive and they are all completely off the rails when it comes to perspective, right? Every one of these groups lacks any, any reasonable measured sense of perspective. It's another way of thinking about cults and, and cultic thinking, you know, is that, is that people's priorities are just completely, completely lost and are out of whack when they get into an extremist headspace. So every criticism is the biggest crime in the world, and every, um, you know, testimonial is the most miraculous statement that could ever be made, and, you know, every utterance from their guru is the most wise wisdom of, uh, you know, an intelligent statements that have ever been made by anybody anywhere at any time in this entire universe, you know, you get these just these mega levels of nonsense, and it's because they exaggerate the importance of the activity, and Scientology is no different with this. Uh, anyway, point being that they can't really take anything in the way of criticism. They can't really take anything in the way of, of uh, you know, a, a perspective. They just lose all perspective, right? And so um, with a group like, you know, with groups that try to help people out of these cults, they become the biggest enemies of mankind that anyone has ever known, right? They, you know, science, the, the Aftermath Foundation puts the Nazis to shame as far as Scientologists are concerned, right? Aaron and Mike and the Headleys and, and any of us who do this work, we are the devil incarnate as far as they are concerned. We are the biggest scumbags to have ever walked the earth. And so this opens the door to and justifies or rationalizes all kinds of awful behavior towards us, right? Because we are the evil, horrible bad guys. And this is why we have to act with some degree of caution and discretion and security in what we are, what we are doing, right? If this is not, I mean, this should all be relatively obvious, but sometimes I have to, you know, we got to talk about this stuff out loud and have a real conversation about it so people understand that we're not just trying to be coy or silly or goofy or paranoid. Um, the, the paranoia is real. I mean, it's, it's, it's justified. It's, it's, a, it's not an irrational uh, fear when you are taking on a group like Scientology. And while they have, um, you know, definitely been defanged in many ways over the years due to their own incompetence and public turmoil and the, just the loads and loads of, you know, decades now of, of, of bad news and, and bad press, it's now understood that groups like Scientology are very, very toxic. And so people are avoiding them. But every day, new versions of this stuff pop up all over the place. If it's not Scientology, it's, you know, it's uh, the, the Nexium or it's some other group, right? Or it's some you know, some nutcase running a martial arts dojo who just gets all, you know, full of himself and decides to start abusing the, the people who are coming to learn from him or her, right? And this kind of thing. In other words, new cults, new groups, new activities pop up every single day. And that's going to be the cycle for as long as people are around. So uh, anyway, not to go all too broad here, but this is why we have to be cautious, okay? Just to kind of paint the full picture there on that. So that all being said, Nick, um, I, you know, I think I've given you as much as I can give you on that. If you want to be an aftermath volunteer and there, and it's a good thing to do. And, and despite everything I've just said, by the way, the aftermath foundation works. I happen to know enough about it, that it works responsibly so that it's not going to put any of its volunteers in any kind of, you know, crosshairs or in any kind of danger in doing the work they do. And that's the other thing. That's another aspect of what they have to think with and think about 
when they are doing their their escapes, when they're you know helping facilitate somebody escaping from the Sea Org or from Scientology. You know, they also do that work with due consideration for the safety of everybody concerned. So, um, so I don't in any way say all this, you know, danger, doom and gloom stuff as, as any effort to try to paint a picture of, you know, a, a, an undue picture of dangerousness or something. Uh, people should, and it is definitely wanted that people volunteer for, uh, that work. So do contact the Aftermath Foundation, do offer to help, do throw some money their way. And, um, and it'll be, it'll be a good thing all around for everybody. So there, that's, <laughs> that's what I can say about that right now. Steve Wood, at what point did you or people in general cross the line in Scientology whereby they accept the entire story, hook, line, and sinker to the degree where all of the cosmology is acceptable and you're willing to remortgage your home Max out your credit cards in what seems to be an unquenchable thirst to obtain as much Scientology as possible. It seems to me this is not too dissimilar from alcoholism or drug addiction, whereby you just have to keep getting more, or have I got that wrong, because there seems to be no end to what people are prepared to do to get as much Scientology as possible. Steve, I hear you, and it's a great analogy you make there comparing it to alcoholism or drug addiction because that is exactly the kind of thing that's going on up here chemically uh, or functionally as far as somebody who is connected up with Scientology auditing goes, right, or, or getting into this, you know, sort of gotta-have-it obsessive state about, you know, doing Scientology or anything like that because it's not just Scientology, it's TM, it's, you know... Uh, all kinds of practices out there. Nexium was like that. It's very electrifying. It's very like invigorating or empowering to feel that you are learning things that other people don't know that are going to give you power and influence and uh, or energy or you know the uh, the ability to ha- lead a better life, make more money. You know when you feel you are being empowered, it's heady. And, uh, and people really like to feel that way. And they want those, they, they want more and more and more of that. And like a drug addict or like somebody who's, you know, getting um, drunk every night on alcohol, you have this deadening kind of thing happens where you need more of it and more of it and more of it to keep getting those. You're still chasing that initial high. And see, that's the thing that actually sells Scientology is the high that one experiences in their first or first few auditing sessions or training sessions, because this used to happen through training as well. People would come into Scientology in the 70s especially and do this communications course, and they would sit there and do TRs. So they'd sit across from somebody and just stare at them for hours. Trance states were induced. People were having all kinds of crazy, weird, delusional experiences. And they were being told that how they should think about that or what that means or what happened to them is that they went exterior. They had an out-of-body experience. That's, that's what explains all those weird sensations you just had, Joe. Or that's what explains this, you know, this whole altered state of consciousness that you're feeling right now. Yeah, that's because you went exterior, man. You were blown out of your head. Whoa, dude. Yeah, like that was what sold Scientology big time is some kind of wow kind of experience that the person can relate back to or can associate with, you know, a spiritual experience or some kind of mega, you know, amazing psychedelic experience that they've had. And then they go, oh, wow, well, I that was great. Yeah, that means you're, you know, with an auditing session, you come out, you're like, wow, I forgot all about that time I was four years old and my mom spanked me and I thought, you know, she was this abusive whore and and I hated her. And now that was the reason why I always had all these problems with my mom, you know, and you could run this whole thing and be quite excited and exhilarated about the possibility of having a, you know, new better relationship or the just the fact of realizing that's why I hated her guts all these years, right? Oh my God, that was it, you know? And 
people can have these these kind of realizations and Scientology will then over exaggerate the importance of it. It's like, yeah, great. Your mom beat you when you were four and you, you had some bad thoughts about that and some trauma. And that really is that's quite interesting. But it's not going to, <laughs> you know, it's not it's not magically going to change your entire life to realize something like that. But it could be made out that it will, and it could be, you know, again, priorities and 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 uh, and perspective, right? You you know, you get this really pumped up idea of this, and this very inflated idea of the power of remembering stuff like that, and you want more. And again, you're chasing that initial high, and you want more and more and more and more and more of it. And at some point along the line, you may be the second time it happens or the third time it happens, something kind of clicks where you make the unwarranted assumption that because you've had these experiences, the interpretation of those experiences must be according to what they told you. In other words, Hubbard's explanations or the staff member's explanations for why you're feeling this way, you believe them. You come to accept that that is the reality of it. It's it's not the reality of it. They are lying to you when they explain to you reactive mind and charge and the E-meter and all that. That's all a bunch of crap. None of that's true. But you buy it as though it's true, and you change and alter your perspective of the world So all the things you now perceive, you perceive through these new filters. Oh, that's a reactive mind. He's yelling and screaming at his wife because he's got engrams, and he just needs to go get his engrams run out, and and they'll have a happy relationship, right? And it has nothing to do with why they're screaming or fighting each other. But you interpret the world through this new lens, this new vision of how things are. And that has a lot to do with chasing that high because now you – now you have to get more auditing, let's say, in order to, to feel this way again. And so now you've directed everything to that. You know, it could well be that you could go smoke some pot or, you know, drop some acid or something and have that same kind of blowout realization or epiphany or cognition, as they call it in Scientology. But you're not going to go do that. You're going to stick to the auditing, and you're going to make that the the foundation of your epiphanies. And so that's what you think you now need in order to live a successful life, is you need more auditing, man, right? And that's where the need to invest more money and more time and more of your energy into that comes from. Uh, it, but it's a very, very, very similar or same process as um, as what you mentioned, Steve, in your question. So with drug addiction and alcoholism and that kind of thing. Um, but it's not necessarily as biochemical, right, obviously, um, because it's induced, you know, the epiphanies or the, the realizations are induced through through trance induction and through repetition and stuff like that. So it doesn't look or feel quite the same as a drug addiction or as an alcohol addiction or a substance abuse addiction, I could say. And so therefore, it's easy to go into denial about it or think it's not that, it's something else. And, and that's how, um, that's how you know, it can be harder to spot for, for what it actually is. Anyway, there you go. I hope that answer helps clarify. Louis B. I want to know more about your course room supervisor experience. What were you like as a course supervisor? Were you strict or laid back? Did you make sure chit chat was kept to a minimum or did you enjoy having a laugh with students? Did you look out for people yawning, zoning out, and then help that person find their misunderstood? What were the people in the course room like? Did you ever have someone disagree with what they were reading and tell you so? Did anyone ever say that what they were reading or doing was nonsense? Did anyone ever walk out of the class annoyed? Did some students look excited to be there and loved everything they read? Were there days when the classroom was empty? Were there days when you had a full class? And was that a good feeling when you saw that? Okay, wow. Well, um, I was a course room supervisor for many, many years. uh, And I supervised a number of different classes in Scientology from 
the low level basic introductory classes all the way up to professional TRs and the key to life and and auditor training and the and the most advanced courses that people can do in Scientology other than the OT levels. I never supervised the OT levels, uh, the classroom work that gets done on those. Uh, but I supervised all the other stuff. And so um so I so kind of yes to everything you just asked, okay? I mean, I experienced all of it. Um, you know, when you supervise Scientology course rooms for years, you do see everything. And I learned an awful lot about how to educate people, and I and I also learned an awful lot about myself and how to react, relate, relate to rather, and react to people and their frustrations and difficulties. Because if there is one thing that will upset people an awful lot, it is when they think they are being denied information or when they cannot seem to get their wits around something. And so it was a great joy for me to feel that I was helping people by helping them understand what L. Ron Hubbard was talking about and having my own understanding of what he was saying and a, and a, and a pretty good grasp of how to help people clarify it for themselves that was the, you know, that was my job for many, many, many years. I became very, very precise um, in terms of time, time regulation and time management because I had to run my course room down to the second as far as when it would start and when it would have break times and when it would end. So I was kind of very, very fastidious about time and always setting my watch according to the time on the phone because back before cell phones and the internet, that's how we did it is you had to call a phone number and it would tell you exactly what time it is <laughs> in case no in case you guys didn't know that uh so it's so funny to me that there are things that have happened in my life now that people just have no clue about because they're just too young <laughs> anyway um yeah so i became quite quite uh fanatic about time but um and also order keeping the roll sheets in order keeping everything organized all that kind of stuff i was a pretty orderly person and i and i ran a pretty i tried to run a pretty tough ship right i wanted people there on time or you were going to go see the ethics officer and i expected people to be all business when they were in the course room which is not to say we didn't ever joke or laugh or or have a good time but it was always focused on getting people through their course room materials and of course, when you've only got two or three students, you know, it's a little hard to be Mr. Tough, uh, you know, drill sergeant, right? Because there's just a couple of people there. So, you know, so depending on on how, how full the place was and what time of day it was and that kind of thing might uh, inform how, you know, relaxed I might be on the floor as a supervisor. But um, but the job was always to, you know, spot people yawning or, or doping off or falling asleep or whatever and get them back on the straight and narrow and clear, the, clear up what they don't understand and, and, and try to make sure that they had a good, productive course period and that they felt like they accomplished something. That was always part of the picture, too. I definitely had all kinds of times when I was a supervisor, especially early on, when I was first trained as a supervisor, where I was very, 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 very full of myself and very full of my skills and and my authority. And you will you will bow down to my authority. You will respect my authority, as Cartman says, right? I was very big on that. And uh, definitely overcompensating because I was, you know, 17, 18. I was, well, when I first became a soup, I think I was 19 years old. And uh, when I actually made it through the training and came back to Santa Barbara, I was 19 or 20. And I um, considered myself younger. I was younger than a lot of the public and the staff, my, my, the other staff members at the church. And, um, and so I was very conscious of that. And I was always trying to fight and push back and trying to, you know, do the best job I could with these, all these older people. But sometimes I messed up and I would get a little too authoritative and people didn't like that. Other times I would try to joke around and be light and, you know, and be a little, little goofy, a little spirit of play, as they put it in Scientology, not be so serious all the time. And sometimes people didn't appreciate that. You know, there was one time I, there was this business kind of guy, he was in his 40s or something. I referred to him as young man. Okay, young man, let's get you a target for the day. And he he did not appreciate hearing that out of my mouth, right? So, so sometimes I would rub people the wrong way and and piss them off, just with my you know, just just 
mixing attitudes or whatever. Um, you know, did anyone ever walk out of the class annoyed? I'm sure they did. I mean, I was an annoying person. So sure, of course, you know. And over the years, I tried to, you know, kind of learn my way and try to feel my way through that and figure out how to how to help people out and, and, and all of that. And anyway, you know, that was kind of how it was. Uh, there were definitely days when the classroom was empty. Absolutely. Lots of times when I had lots of downtime and I would work on writing letters or calling people or scheduling them or that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, there were days when I had a full class and it felt quite good. Absolutely. You know, but for me, you know, a full classroom was like 15 people. <laughs> it didn't take much. So, um, you know, but then there were times when I was supervising down in LA or when I was on my internships or when I was learning to be a supervisor, I was, I trained in Los Angeles at the Sea Org facilities. So there were times when I was on my training where I had like 90, 100 students that I was running all over. I was sweating, trying to reach everybody and get everything done, right? So it was, uh, I, I had all kinds of experiences as a course room supervisor in terms of that stuff. But um, the main thing that I walked away from all those years with that to this day still helps serve me is, you know, a, a good, like a real I, I, an, I, an insightful understanding when I'm dealing with somebody in front of me in terms of trying to teach them something. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good at that now. And um, at least when I try to be, when I try to focus on that, uh, you know, explaining things to people, working out different ways of approaching a topic or a subject, you know, different, different vectors of approach so that you can try to break things down, figuring out how to take things apart simply so that, you know, complex things can be understood by, you know, the, as a sum of their parts and that kind of thing. You know, a lot of a lot of work over the years figuring out how people learn things or how to explain things to people or show people things so that they get it. You know, there was a lot of figuring that out over the years as a soup, and and that was that's something I think I still carry around with me to this day. While the rest of it, I've kind of you know dumped into the trash heap. So, uh, so there you go, Rob Kupiets. In a recent critical clip, you were talking about Sea Org staff at local orgs. You mentioned a position that is in part in charge of advertising. What type of advertising do they do? I have lived in the Twin Cities all my life, and I have never seen a billboard or heard a radio commercial for Scientology. I presume they must do more than just wait for someone to walk into the local org. All right, Rob, thank you for this. Um, just briefly, I will tell you that they engage in all manner of advertising, print media, radio. Um, not locally, they don't do television much, but they, but sometimes. Um, and of course, internet ads and all the range of internet ads that can occur. Any org can do any of these, depending on how much money and will it has to spend that money on that kind of advertising budget. Most of Scientology orgs don't have a whole lot of money for promotion and marketing. So they'll only do leaflets or test pass outs on the street or try to sell books and, you know, that kind of thing. Or they'll run newspaper ads. Sometimes they'll do inserts in the local papers. At least they used to, right, where they'll put insert uh, more, inform, you know, kind of ads or flyers or, or uh, personality tests. You know, we used to we used to big be huge, huge on sending out what we called pink OCAs. They were a personality test printed on pink paper. For some reason, that was always a hit. You could print them on yellow paper, you wouldn't get as many back. You could print them on white paper, you wouldn't get as many back. You print them on pink paper, people fill them out. I got nothing as to why that is, but pink OCAs were the thing. Um, if you wanted to get people in for the purification rundown, you had to send out thousands of purif broadsheets. They were these great big oversized, you know, like 18 by 11 sheet papers that talked all about the purification rundown. And if you could get out 10,000 of those, then in a few weeks, you would see an increase in purif starts and delivery. So I was always big on getting out lots and lots and lots of purification promo. Uh, so that's that kind of stuff, right, is what you will tend to see these orgs actually doing because they can't afford to do the higher level stuff. Um, Twin Cities did do, you might have heard in my talk with Catherine Olson, 
we talked about this non-existence campaign that the ideal orgs get where they get a, a good chunk of money in order to do advertising and that advertising is worked out at the international level for that local region to uh to you know get the community to learn and know something about them and so they'll do radio ads maybe local tv even internet ads etc Catherine talked a bit about that in our interview so you can also check that out that was just posted a couple weeks ago and um that's that's what you get so there you go rob all right, and that is our show for this week. I was going to maybe do some flash answers, but well, you know the length of the show, we're going to skip them this week, but I will keep them in my queue and we will get to those. Thanks very much for coming around. And again, I will put a plug in here because um, you know it's important. If you can support the show, if you can help us out, we would really, really appreciate it. Even a dollar a month on Patreon, you know, buy me a cup of coffee, right? That kind of thing. Every little bit really does help. All right. That being said, I will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.